I'm here to speak about relationships in the workplace. Now, sorry, Trisha from accounting, not that kind of relationships, <laughs> but instead those with managers, bosses, employers, clients. This next 15 minutes is going to be directed to young people listening, but my hope is that there are going to be tidbits within that are extremely relevant across the board, across the age demographics. My name is Peter Matthews, I'm 22 years old, and for the past four years, I've run a small business that operates in an extremely client relationship intensive industry, strategic marketing. Now, over these four years, the work that we have delivered has changed quite a bit, but the fundamental styles and strategies that we hope to use when dealing with clients have stayed fundamentally the same. It's on the back of this that I have some recommendations today. But first, what are we young people doing wrong? In my mind, there are really three things that so often we young folks, we miss the mark with. Number one, over-enthusiasm. Too loud, too fast, too in your face, too much. Number two, we can often be a little bit bad at communicating our expertise outside the specific task that we're working on in the workplace. And number three, we can be unrelatable. Even the most professional 18-year-old's weekend probably looks a little bit different to that of a twice-divorced, three-child parent industry professional. These three components spell what I deem the age divide in clients or workplace relationships. I'd like to introduce five hopelessly biased rules to live by when a young person or an industry professional looking to deal with those in the workplace with whom there is a bit of an age divide. So, rule number one, the value of small talk. The year is 2018, and I've just booked a coffee with a man named Neil. Neil was a potential long-term high-value client, and to be very honest with you, I was the epitome of over-enthusiastic. Were you to be a fly on the wall in the week leading up to this coffee, and you were to be in my bathroom at 7 o'clock, you would see me pacing around, toothbrush in mouth, reciting specific words and phrases that I wanted to get pitch perfect on the day of the coffee. A little bit of dribble coming down the side. Too much. Well, the week went by, it's the day of the coffee, and I get a text from Neil about an hour before. He's going to be five minutes late. Well, no worries, I'm already there. <laughs> hour goes by, or an hour and five minutes, I see Neil walking in, here's what happens. Neil, g'day mate, it's so good to see you. I can't wait. Mate, let's talk about some real synergies we've got going on. Come on, take a seat, let's hop into it. <laughs> Poor bloke. <laughs> Neil, I see a bit of a sweat patch for me. He's got a bit of a thousand yard stare going on. He hasn't even had a chance to order his coffee. I get a couple more 100 mile per hour uh, words in before Neil puts a literal hand up in front of me at this coffee table and says, Peter, how are you? <laughs> how was your day? Oh, thanks, Neil. It just got a, a little bit worse, but you know. With a face of blushing, I thankfully take the hit. Neil is telling me to slow down. Remember to build the relationship before the business. Neil and I move into five minutes of somewhat uneasy small talk, and unsurprisingly, we don't win the contract. But Neil gave me a lesson that day that I've now thoroughly incorporated into how I present professionally and that I'd like to share with you. 
Engaging in small talk before jumping into the business topic at hand achieves a few things. Number one, it gives both counterparties the opportunity to calm down a little bit. Forget the stress of the freeway, finding a park, gives you time to order a coffee. And the other thing as well is that it builds that relatability. By not jumping straight into a business task, you're able to find more common ground particularly when there is an age divide. Rule number two. Silence is as uncomfortable as we let it be. The year is 2018 again. What a year. <laughs> I'm sitting down with a man named Jar. We're also at a coffee shop. Jar is actually an existing client. He and I have been working together at that time for already about three months. And at this point, we're talking about a potential longer term engagement and we're sitting down for coffee. Thus far, the conversation seems to be going well. There's a little bit of repartee, some jokes flying around. He's making fun of my terrible job parallel parking. <laughs> And then when we get into the business task at hand, things are going well too, until I bring up pricing. This is Jar. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> Not a word. I'm sitting there. I am witnessing this silence. A couple of seconds go by before internally I start freaking out. <laughs> what the heck is going on? What have I done wrong? Well, Jar was certainly doing something right because without needing to say a word, I promptly proceeded to talk myself down to a 25% discount. <laughs> Jar just sitting here like this. This is the extreme of what I consider the silence game, where on one end we have something like this, but on the other we have things like umming and ahhing when we're in a conversation and we want to fill a space when we're unsure. This sort of thing, firstly, if you're a dork like me, leaves an opportunity to be taken advantage of, but so too it really makes it harder to relate because somebody is overenthusiastic or they're too much or they're difficult to sit down with. The good news is, being uncomfortable with silence is very easy to remedy. Step one, accept that if there is silence in a conversation that you're a part of, it's because the other person has stopped talking, not because you need to. And number two, once number one's looked after, if we can be sure of our value in the conversation, we can wait it out. If we're in the chat and the other person's staying in the chat as well, then it's clearly something's going right. If they're not getting up and walking away, they're there to stay, just wait it out. That's silence. Rule number three speaks about the importance of advising a client or a boss and not just working hard. Now, when we as young people, or really anyone in the workplace, are sitting down for a conversation with a boss, a manager, an employer, chances are it's because they have a project outcome in mind that they want us to deliver. Let's call that point B. We're currently at point A. We're getting the job, we're being assigned the task, and we know we need to work pretty hard to deliver a great outcome at point B. And so that's what 90% of the population is going to do. It's my view that the time in between point A and point B is a sorely underutilised opportunity to, in the context of a client-facing role, win more work, in the context of a managerial relationship, build relatability, and in all in common, show more expertise. In 2019, so new year, new me, <laughs> 
My small business won a procurement round with Hockey Western Australia, which is the government-funded body responsible for overseeing hockey in Western Australia. The original scope of our work was just to handle the launch marketing for the new state hockey team. But while working with Hockey WA and dealing with Hockey WA's general manager, Tom, I quickly noticed that there were other issues that Hockey WA was encountering that I knew a little bit about. So I went to Tom and I said, Tom, I'm still, of course, going to be looking at this point B deliverable outcome with the launch marketing. But would you like me while I'm here to just have a look and see if I might be able to make some recommendations about X, Y, Z that I've also noticed? What just happened? If Tom said no, big deal. I'm still going to deliver that project B outcome or that point B outcome. At worst, Tom's going to think that I have a little bit more expertise than otherwise. But if Tom says yes, suddenly, in a client-facing perspective, that's potentially one more work. But in the context of an employment relationship, that demonstrates greater expertise and it builds relatability. An example in maybe an accounting setting. Someone's just received an assignment to do something on the computer. When they've received the task, they've gone to their boss. Their boss is having a problem with Outlook or something, some old person thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so we as the young people could say, well, look, I suspect I might know a way of doing that a little bit faster. Would you like me to have a look? Uh, fine if not. Boss says yes, great. Some extra brownie points. Boss says no, no dramas. Still going to deliver that point B outcome. Rule number four. Taking feedback positively does very, very good things. Let's say we as young people, we've just spent a couple of months building a really, really great presentation to give to a client or a boss. We've put our heart and soul into this presentation. And when we've gone through it, we think we've done pretty well. But our boss or our client gives this as their first piece of feedback. I think you should have done that better. Bummer. There's at least two ways of responding to that. The first way might be to say, well, actually we did. As you can see on slide seven, appendix N, this is something we spoke about five minutes ago. Would you like us to go back over that so that maybe it comes across a bit clearer? What, what has that just done? It set up a contradiction between the giver of the feedback and the receiver, and in doing so, it's put the existing rapport relationship at risk. What's another way? Wow, you're right. I hadn't seen it like that. That's a very good thing to point out. This is something that we attempted to show on slide seven, appendix N, but as you've mentioned, we missed the mark. Uh, if I could, I'd like to follow up after this meeting and, and come back to you on that. Fundamentally, the same thing has been said. We've still drawn attention to slide seven, appendix N, but suddenly we're not creating a contradiction between the giver of the feedback and us, the receiver. Rule number five. Rule number five is a little bit cheeky. It's actually made up of three very fast rules that there's a pop quiz on at the end. Just kidding. Number one, reply first, fast, and last. Replying first, you ever received an email from a boss with 50 CC'd recipients inviting you to a barbecue or something? Majority of people aren't gonna reply my advice, do. But definitely not reply all, you monster. <laughs> Just reply and say thanks. You've risked nothing, but you've shown that you're approachable and that you're engaged. Reply fast, speaks for itself. Reply last. You ever seen a movie and there's, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> Something like that, but with a client or with a boss. Say thanks in an email, and if they say thanks back, say thanks to their thanks, and then if they say thanks again, probably leave it there, but <laughs> point being, demonstrate approachability, demonstrate that you are there and engaged, reply first, fast, and last. Second rule, advise and summarize. 
When we as young folks are presenting a potentially controversial or risque risk idea to a room full or group of people, we'll achieve much better outcomes if we contact each of those attendees directly, personally first, and give them a little bit of a heads up of what to expect so that they're not walked in, they don't walk in to a surprise. To summarize is to say that after any meeting, write up a copy of notes, send it over to the person that the meeting was with, whether it's a group of attendees or, or just one, and make sure that the key takeaways of the meeting, the key walkaways, are mutually agreed on before you move on to the next topic. Firstly, this looks after you if there's a disagreement down the line, but secondly too, it makes sure that the client feels listened to and that you or we are able to demonstrate that we are relatable. Rule number three, positive language. When we are ascribing responsibility or blame, if it's to us, active voice, if it's to anyone else, passive voice, what does this mean? We would say, I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing, I didn't attach that to the email. But if we're saying that someone else did any of those things, we say, the email was missing an attachment. Or we say, uh, it looks like something might have been done wrong there. Or maybe something was missing. The key difference is that the first shows that we accept responsibility for our actions. It invites accountability. But on the second, it's not giving that accountability to anybody else. It's letting everybody else feel as if they aren't being accused of anything. It builds relatability. So there we have it. Five or seven, if you hold me to my maths, <laughs> rules to live and talk by in the workplace and the entry level. I'd like to summarise or end this talk by saying that I completely disclaim liability for any of those should they go wrong. <laughs> But I wish you all very well in this arena and thank you for your time.